Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, today we are casting a rather wide net um, and we will be exploring the broad topic of innovation in hip surgery. Now there's a lot in there, but I can think of uh, no one better placed to help guide us through uh, this, this broad topic than Professor Justin Cobb. So thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure, Axel. <laughs> uh, yeah, I re really look forward to, to digging into your experience uh, of the changes that have occurred in, you know, in, in your career uh, in, in hip surgery, sort of in general, and then, and then digging into a few things more specifically. Uh, but before we begin, uh, would, you, would you mind sort of introducing us and, and our, our viewership to, to yourself? Sure. So I'm my name's Justin Cobb. I'm Professor of Orthopedics at Imperial College in London. And I spend about half my time operating on people and looking after them and about half my time in the lab trying to figure things out and trying to work with our gang, uh, both in my group and in the wider group in college, trying to find ways of doing things better. Yeah. Because we've definitely got lots of room for improvement across a whole wide range of topics that we might talk about a bit this afternoon yeah indeed indeed now i know you've come you've come very prepared and you have some some slides for us shall we yeah shall i thought i'd just them? rather than just listening to some old codger ramble i'd just show you some pictures <laughs> yeah, um yeah. so let's let's um um can you see this yes yeah very okay good. so um you mentioned first of all that we might talk about how we measure things and i think for anyone who likes um, who's of a, a, a scientific training, then, you know, if you can't measure it, it just doesn't exist. We really have to measure. And obviously, as, as a surgeon, and surgeons cut people open with knives and then do things inside the body and then sew them up again, if you're going to do that to someone, you've really got to understand about safety and efficacy and how, and so how we measure those things. Um, I'm just going to quickly whiz through a bit of that. Yep. So if we're lucky, I will be able to just zoom in to that. Mm -hmm. And so the metrics that are currently in use um, may not be entirely fit for purpose. Um, objective metrics of safety and efficacy are still somewhat debated in medicine, bizarrely. One wouldn't expect it, but it seems to be true. So safety, I think most of us would say, well, the, the absolute hallmark of safety is am I going to die during the operation or not? And of course, these days, the answer is you're not. It's very, very, very rare for someone to die intraoperatively. I don't think I've ever seen an intraoperative death in a, someone having a routine hip replacement. I've never, never even heard of it. But perioperatively, historically, there used to be a sort of 1% or so um, 90 day mortality associated with having an operation that mostly has dropped right down mm -hmm. um, it's much less than that now but the impact of having an operation definitely is non-negligible um, and one me way of measuring that is looking at in huge groups of people the number of people who are still alive 10 years after an operation and of course with any operation you wonder were they randomized here or where actually the people having one operation and the ill people having another operation. And so right now, from the outset, I would say we don't have any really strong data to say that um, hip resurfacing, which is an operation I want to spend most of today talking about because it's um, something interesting to talk about, I suppose. Um, we've got no evidence that it's dangerous. In fact, a bit the opposite. So um, in the BMJ, um, more than 10 years ago now, I think, um, the um, guys in Oxford, sorry, not only seven years ago, um, uh, set about looking at the dangers of metal on metal hip replacement. And they've they published more papers on the terrible side effects or hip resurfacing than any other group in the world by some way. And so um, Adrian um, Kendall in his PhD went to um, the hospital episode statistics from the NHS to look at mortality associated with hip resurfacing and cemented and cementless hip replacement mm. and because they published this group had published eight or ten articles on pseudo tumors and how bad resurfacing was for people and the reoperations and the failures and so on mm. they fully expected to have some pretty bad news to tell mm. but actually what they found and the top line here are graphs this is um in the first quarter in 90 days here mm -hmm. 
and this is um, the risk of dying, very small, it's only tiny percent first uh, 90 days, but this is um, cemented hip replacement, this is resurfacing, and this is out to 10 years. This is cemented hip replacement, this is resurfacing, and this is data corrected as much as they could for age, gender, comorbidities. They couldn't, um, and this big difference, and this is, this is cement less hip replacement and hip resurfacing. So this is a large number. These are tens of thousands of people, very clever group, honestly trying to show that hip resurfacing was bad for people, and they found the opposite. So I'm actually not claiming any survival advantage of resurfacing. All I'm saying is there's no evidence it's bad for you, and at least it's as safe. In fact, the evidence, such as it is, is that hip resurfacing is much safer for you than having a big metal stem glued into the middle of your femur, which if your leg was a hockey stick with a big bit of metal stuck in the middle of it, it wouldn't be a very good hockey stick. And we'll come to why that might also be true um, in hip replacements. So on safety alone, and the Australian registry shows exactly the same numbers, on safety alone, resurfacing is quite safe. It is safer than hip replacement by any metric, but probably much of that difference is actually residual confounding rather than real difference in safety, probably. Interesting, interesting. Now, now I know the, the question of hip resurfacing and hip replacement and the difference between the two uh, is, is something that, that, that many, many people who are getting ready for, 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 uh, for, for hip replacement or hip resurfacing will find a little bit confusing what the difference yeah. is between the two and especially a bit disconcerting what you might find when looking around on the internet to read about sure. metal, metal. So difficult to get balance. It, it, it comes up all the time and I know we, we could do a very long dedicated session only on the differences between sure. resurfacing and replacement. But for those who, for whom, who, who might be a bit uh, newer to, to the topic, could you summarize what is the main difference between a, uh, the convention? So the only difference really is that in a resurfacing, one is machining away the head of the femur, just the surface and putting a new metal or ceramic lining on that femoral head and then putting a, a socket in the, in the pelvis much the same as you would either way with the resurfacing, with the replacement, you actually put a post inside the femur. And on the end of that, you put a ball. That's the, that's the only difference. And in um, frailer and elderly women who um, live forever, um, but nevertheless, their skeletons get weaker, that femoral neck, which is often a slender waist of bone between the femur itself and the, and the femoral head, that femoral neck, is at risk in one's lifetime. And in, in, in the 90s, the risk of a femoral neck fracture goes up really spectacularly. So for, for older, frailer women, that femoral neck is a slight design fault. And one would definitely think of a replacement is a much more sensible, safe thing to do. For, on the other end of the spectrum, for a muscly man or a very fit young woman who are going out for runs and have worn themselves out running around, then a hip replacement might be disappointing because that femoral stem inside the bone may not, in some people it's fine for running, but in some people it's not so good for running. And yeah. a reception may be an alternative. And, and, and therein, I think, li lies the answer to a question that we see very frequently for, I think for, for anyone who starts, who starts looking, for, looking for answers around hip replacement and hip resurfacing, you'll very quickly find that there was a famous tennis, tennis player who not too long ago had a hip resurfacing. Mm -hmm. And then you start, wondering, well, I'm being recommended a hip replacement or perhaps not, and the differences between them, so. Well, the other thing I would say, and we're not, I won't come back to this, again, I don't think this afternoon, but I would say is the most important thing is that you have whatever operation you have done right. Yeah. Yeah. And if you like and get on with your surgeon and he or she does a good job, then you're in a very happy and safe place. You'll have um, a replacement or a resurfacing that's very likely to last your whole life long. And to try and make that person do something that they're not comfortable doing is a bad idea. Yeah. And as a sort of, I think as a thing, particularly with, with surgeons, because we have to do things to people with our hands. And you, 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 if someone is saying, I don't think this is right for you, mm. then mainly I would say we as a group of surgeons, we didn't get here by mistake. We got here by being trained for a very long time and really always trying to do what's best and safest in our hands. Yeah. And um, we will talk about uh, uh, skills and acquiring skills and, and practicing those skills. Um, that's a slightly different issue, yeah. but 
but for the patient and the surgeon together it isn't like choosing a paint color you know it just isn't like that um, um it, uh, it is uh, the surgery is a multi-step skilled process and and the difference between a a surgeon doing any hip replacement that he or she does well and the same operation being done badly that's a bigger difference than the difference between resurfacing and replacement yeah yeah absolutely i should let you return to so, to... so you axel sensibly said how do we measure whether operations work or not and hip replacement is so successful why are we bothering so i've just put a few slides together about about um metrics i suppose and so the oxford hip score and for people who like um histograms this is the Oxford HIP score preoperatively. And you see the Oxford HIP score really has the whole range of people's experience with 48 being full marks, mm -hmm. um, really no symptoms at all. And on, on the Oxford HIP score, there are people with no symptoms at all in the Oxford HIP score who are still limited, bizarrely. Um, and then right down here, these are people who are um, in um, um, the words of um, Rachel Rosser, um, in a state worse than death. You know, they really are having a very, very tough time. Yeah. But post-operatively, the commonest score is full marks in hip replacements. Yeah. And the median is, um, sorry, the mean is 44, but by far the commonest score is 48, and the median is 47. Yeah. So, so you can't use the Oxford score to tell the difference between operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just can't do that. And this is Tom Edwards is responsible for this histogram, which is just lovely. Yeah. And um, I mean, it really does show you how if anybody says the average postdoc score, well, in their maths GCSE mm -hmm. or in the run up to maths GCSE, their maths teacher would put a red pen through them and say, you can't use average of a distribution like that. You just can't use it. It's not helpful. And weirdly, a randomized controlled trial of resurfacing and replacement used this score. Yeah. yeah. And said there was no difference. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's no difference. This yeah. actually um, is, again, Tom made this lovely graph. This is Oxford HIP score of um, resurfacings and replacements pre op and post op in our group. And you see the hip replacements are a bit worse pre op mm -hmm. than the resurfacings. Mm -hmm. And so their health gain. In the Oxford HIP score is greater than resurfacings. Yeah. So if you use the Oxford HIP score, hip replacement is more effective than hip resurfacing. Right. Hip res and surgeons who do hip resurfacing are less effective than surgeons doing hip replacement. And GERFT, the GERFT program, the Get It Right First Time program, will report to those surgeons and tell them they're underperforming because their health gain using a metric with this terrible ceiling effect yeah. is insufficient and they should change their practice to produce more health gain using this metric which has no upside and has had no upside for 20 years so it's an amazing world isn't it so that's the Oxford HIP score. although i would have to flag for, for for the many people watching this video who either have recently com completed an oxford hip score uh, <laughs> pending pending your procedure or or, or, or are awaiting you know, what some of the uh, key post-op milestones where you will be asked to complete the survey, please do complete the Oxford HIPS score. Oh yes, it's very helpful data. And we all really want to know if you're not getting 44 or above, yeah. then what's the problem? Yeah, absolutely. You know, because we all don't want you to be, really, if you're under, under 44 mm. with a, after hip surgery, then, Honestly, then there's something else going on. Sometimes it's got a terrible back as well. Sometimes it's the knee, but sometimes the geometry hasn't been quite right with the hip replacement. Yeah. But that's the Oxford HIP score. Yeah. Now, that's a measure of 12 different variables added together. So you add how much you limp to how sore you are, to where, how you manage stairs, and that's a, it's a, it's a questionnaire. We, I'm a, I love um, continuous variables. So... And we'll use, we're going to use um, speed in a minute. But the Surgeon General and NHS England, the Surgeon General of America, NHS England, both recommend exercise. And they say exercise is good for you. Getting your heart rate up is good for you. So conditioning exercise is good for you. Mm -hmm. Simply playing golf is not good enough. You actually want to get your heart rate up to be really healthy. We know this. This is the best evidence I've got 
I've come across, which is this is a twin study from Finland. So these people are genetically identical. Mm -hmm. And in the conditioning exercises, compared conditioners compared to those who were sedentary, mm -hmm. there was a hazard ratio of death of 0.57. For the conditioning exercises so those tw the twin that kept themselves fit and healthy had a substantial hazard ratio reduction for death so so exercise kept those people healthy i think that's causative relationship i don't know for sure but there's some evidence that keeping active is helpful now the university of arizona produced something called the met index and that's a compendium of physical activities used by diabetes doctors, hypertension doctors, physiotherapists, um, health coaches around the world, because they measure how many kilocalories per hour you burn. So this is a real, it's almost a measure of, of cardiac output. Mm -hmm. Or rather, if you then put it by time and intensity, it's how, how often you do something and how long you do it for, you measure the cardiac output. If you just use the number of the met, it's what you can do. It's not what you're actually doing, it's what you can do. So because we're not trying to measure the cardiac output and we're not trying to uh, compete with those, with the diabetes doctors or the heart doctors on fitness, we're just really talking about capability. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at what you can do. And really over six, on the met score is conditioning exercise and they've, they've got 400 different things in endless different things and, and just to be funny i put i put um so here we are look at this hunting deer is six hunting large game dragging the carcass is 11 all right whereas and how you hunt a large marine animal i have no idea but it's only four cricket is rather low because most of the time in cricket you're in the pavilion or standing picking daisies on the boundary and they've got things for sex as well who knows what but but when you use that that met then what we find interesting is in the knee you can completely separate out total knee replacement from partial knee replacements with the total knees um really hitting getting up to around about the six mark but not much more with the partial knees going higher mm -hmm. um and what tom showed with the uh, resurfacings um, resurfacings median of about 12 replacements median of about 10. now that's not randomized data but this, this is over time now you see that the resurfacings um, do seem to be different in terms of what they're met so the the runners people who like running get back to running with the resurfacing i think that's the real difference there not randomized data it's purely observational so don't don't um take anything from it Here's just a woman I put up just because I saw her. Literally, this is from last week. This is a two year follow up. And we talked about the Oxford score. Now, look, she's peaked at 41. Wow. She was 41 a year ago, and she's still 41. In her EQ5D, she's pretty happy, although she's still got some pain and discomfort. So she's not a great success, is she? And using her MET, this is actually a complex MET, but her gymnastics and her gardening and her walking are all going up. And her visual analog scale says she's very, very happy, even though her Oxford score's there. So here she is a year after surgery. And if I'm lucky, this will run. Oh, it won't run. Oh, anyway, the fact is she's using a walking stick. Okay, she's walking very nicely. The video is not going to run for us. Oh, hang on. Uh, no, it's not going to run. Not to worry. Um, but, but actually, she had a hip replacement two years ago, but her operation was for a hip arthrodesis takedown. So she, aged 13, had her hip fused. Mm -hmm. And so for a fusion to be taken down and get to 41, that is really very good. Mm -hmm. So for her, this is a very good result. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, it's a disappointment if you, if you want everyone to be 48. And so for someone who's had their hip fused all throughout our life, it's a very good result. She actually cared about her knee, but that's not a story. So that's subjective measures, um, a sort of introduction to them and how, certainly from a science point of view, if you're trying to publish improvements, you can't restrict yourself to the Oxford hip score because yeah. you cannot get any benefit from it. We have to use other measures. And I hope I'm going to persuade you that the other measures show a real difference. Um, the MET score seems to, um, um, but although we don't have any randomized data from that, with the gait now, there is a bit of interesting data in that regard. 
Okay, interesting. I don't know whether you want me to go straight on to that, or do you want to talk about that? Well, before, or Oxford scores. Before we move on to uh, to Gate, I think just if we if we sort of just double back and summarise a little bit about about these surveys, because that's something that's a very it's a very tangible thing for everyone out there who is getting ready for surgery, who has had it. You know, you'll be asked to complete surveys, and and most specifically in the UK, that will be. For a hip replacement, that will be the Oxford hip score and EQ5D in most cases. In some places, you might also be asked to complete a few other surveys, but that's very much the, the mainstream, so to speak. Uh, and they do have a role. They, they do have a role to play. Yes, uh, and, and pre-op, actually, they absolutely have a role in describing someone's symptoms yeah. pre-operatively. Yeah. They're, they're just not sufficient post-operatively. Yeah. Um, if you ask me, because I really want to know what your limitations are yeah, 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 yeah. if we are not interested in what your limitations are then use the oxygen score um but if you want to know your limitations then then i'll ask what are the limitations what can't you do and of course for most people hip replacement is a very successful operation and they pretty much can do whatever they like yeah. um so so you could say well why are you asking these difficult questions um, i wouldn't ask difficult questions for anyone over a certain age what is that age about 85. I think over 85, the Oxford score was just fine. If you're under 85, then we may actually be not being quite ambitious enough. Over 85, fewer and fewer people, and I keep on being wrong, but fewer and fewer people do, do much aerobic exercise. And now, if I say this, I'm now going to be hammered. Over 90. Okay, over 90. <laughs> Although no, not too long ago, we did an interview with uh, a sister Madonna Buder, who is a 93 year old triathlete. So, who's had a hip yeah. replacement? So, well, indeed, another of my patients um, had a hip replacement when he was 97. Yeah. And um, he would, if I, yeah, he would tell me off for. For, uh, <laughs> yeah. for but, but by and large, we're, we're speaking in general terms, and I think so. The, the Oxford Hip Score is an example of what many might encounter uh, the acronym a PROM, a patient reported outcome measure. Uh, and I think what you're talking about with the sort of the more subjective and the more granular and the more personable, there's a really nice phrase, which I don't know if you coined, but it's the uh, instead of patient reported outcome measure, there's a patient centered outcome. It, measure. I definitely didn't coin it. No, no, no. It exists. The health economists talk about it. Yeah, yeah. The challenge for patient centered outcome measures. Um, it's a really good example of a technology of a way of looking at the world that until we went online, it couldn't exist hmm. because if you're using a bit of paper, then to say, I've got 383 different um, activities here. Will you just go through them? I mean, no one can do that. No one can do that. Whereas with a, map, with a score now, if either you, the patient, or a helpful um, daughter or son or someone will just start typing the first two letters of the activity, out will come uh, some options of the activity. So obviously, um, you know, for K could be anything. K A kayaking is pretty much all it is. Um, but so because online you can have hundreds of different activities all there, um, we can use patient-centered scores. And then using how many kilocalories per hour they all burn, you can absolutely cross-reference them. So you can compare someone who's a kayaker with someone who's a um, a, a runner or a yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's exactly it right that, that, and then you're getting into the heart of the matter to the goal to what is meaningful for that individual person that's right. what they want to that's right. quality of life what they're aiming for after and what they want well because we're all so different yeah. and you know, ballroom dancing is a great example you know people are i some people love ballroom dancing other people hate it yeah. so you can't judge everybody on ballroom dancing mm -hmm. And um, rugby is the same. They're all the same. Football is the same. Some people love soccer. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Now, so we've talked a bit about a type of measurement. You know, these these different surveys. Now, analyzing gait, as in how how we walk and move, is another type of measurement that I know you have a great deal of experience in. Yeah, and 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 um, it's not everything. And of course, many people with a sore hip. Not many. Some people with a sore hip. A particular pattern of hip disease actually once they've got walking they're okay most people though walking is mo most people with with um, the common patterns of hip arthrosis find walking very difficult mm -hmm. and therefore walking is quite a good metric and certainly our hips we use 
for walking. And so walking is a, is a good metric for hip and knee pathology. It's a very poor metric indeed for shoulder pathology. Um, not a bad one for spines, interestingly enough. And the nice thing about um, using a, a, um, machines that measure how people walk is that you have lots and lots and lots of variables. So you can't really watch how they do it. But in the end, speed is something we all understand. Yeah. And everyone's had the experience of going on a family walk and either there's someone who's just appallingly slow walking slowly for some people is very hard but of course walking quickly for other people is impossible and that uh, that difference in walking speed both what you like doing and what you can do are very interesting variables that aren't the same as life and death but they are variables that we can measure and talk about yeah. So, so, so what is the role then for, for a gait analysis, for really analysing how someone moves uh, before and after hip replacement? I think it's a really good um, safety shot mm -hmm. um, because if, it, if someone is walking, there are so many ways in which we can say you're walking just like someone with a sore hip. Right, yeah. yeah. So... I think in the AI world, I don't, I don't see it far away that, that you could go to the shopping mall and get onto a machine which will say either your problem is you're too heavy, you know, stop eating, you know, stop carbohydrates, do the Boris Johnson thing. Um, that, you know, or, goodness, you know, that knee that's really play, that's bad enough for you to think about going to see an orthopedic surgeon. So just objective metrics, we can completely say, you're way too good for surgery. You know, okay, you're complaining, but I can't make you better than this. Yeah, yeah. Or this is how you are right now. Look at this group of people who, had, who were just like you before and look where they are now. Is that difference, the sort of difference that you're interested in? So it's a whole different language, I suppose, of how are you doing? But of course, it is this monodimensional thing of walking. Um, but it is, it's very interesting. The other thing, just quickly, in terms of your brain health, I'm, a, I'm definitely most obsessed with keeping people's brain healthy. If, and with age, balance deteriorates tyrannically, absolutely tyrannically, and that the sort of chaotic gait of someone whose balance has gone is um, very unpleasant to see and is can be helped by the removal of pain and stiffness um, but it is a if someone's got a very chaotic gait that would make one think well oh, is this spinal stenosis is this parkinson's is this diabetes um is this neuropathy you know what's going on this isn't just a hip so, so there are lots of interesting dimensions to gait analysis so, and as, I guess a challenge with with gait analysis, as with many innovations, you know, there, there's that um, that famous saying from the, the science fiction author William Gibson, who said, "The future is already here; it's just unevenly distributed." And I guess with with gait analysis, it's it's something that's not that accessible for for in in many cases when having a hip replacement. Do you know? Um, I suspect that. Um... In fact, I know that um, any any household with game consoles and that sort of, those sorts of levels, the the Kinect technology is easily good enough to do all the gate analysis necessary for all of lower limb arthroplasty. Easily good enough. So it's the it's already here. It's just not being deployed. Yeah. yeah. And partly that's because. Um, until now, most of the deliverers of healthcare don't particularly want to rattle that cage because they've got a product that's 100% successful. So they're not very interested in being told, well, you said you're 100% successful, but actually, according to this new improved measure, you're less successful than that. Well, no one's going to adopt it. So, so it's only really for people who are trying to do science and technology that this sort of um, analysis has has huge value. I mean, I would say if, um, for, for patients, it's very, very, very interesting. Um, but it is slightly complicated to sell to a, um, a health service that's, a re that's delivering the fantastic results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yet perhaps in, in an ideal world, 
there would be the opportunity for everyone to have their gait analyzed before and after surgery. And, and in every, I mean, actually, of course, it, uh, the, the, the simple thing of just going to um, the local um, gym and getting on a treadmill and just seeing what speed you're comfortable going at mm. and what speed do you think, I just can't do this anymore, and the same with gradient. That single metric of top speed and that how you are right now and how you are afterwards, that, that sim very simple metric is, is enough to totally discriminate between a hip replacement and resurfacing, for instance, completely discriminate between the two. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. So, so you don't need a uh, fancy um, 60,000 quids worth of equipment to tell that. You just need a stop, um, the treadmill and how many kilometers an hour you're doing. And it completely tells the difference between total knees and partial knees. I mean, just top speed alone. Just top speed alone. Interesting. Interesting. But yeah, it's really interesting. That. To a degree, one might... Ex is that even corrected for age? Because I guess... For Do you know, corrected for age, gender, leg length... Oh, right. I mean, of course, everybody will say that you're just biased, but I will show you some evidence. Okay, well, let, let, let's dig into some evidence. Come on. <laughs> so, so, eight years ago, um, Anatole Wick, who is a very good surgeon, um, um, presented some data that um, Helen and he captured from Angus Lewis, another surgeon colleague, and I, and Andrew Amos, a very wonderful engineer. We presented this at the American Academy. Um, and got absolute he got hammered he was, everyone was so rude to him i can't tell you um but he showed that this was the title of his talk hip resurfacing enables fast walking along the strides and what he showed and this is this is a top speed now martin levine is a very good surgeon in uh, montreal and he had published um a randomized trial with just this tiny difference in speed but it was um, a very small difference because they, were, they weren't really going fast. Mm -hmm. Whereas in our group, the total hips were going up 1.89, much faster than his resurfacings. Mm -hmm. But the resurfacings were going at 2.06. That's a huge difference in top speed. It's a really big difference. That's that's. It's a huge difference in top speed. And, and just to clarify for people here on on this graph here, HRA. So, is Surfacing. That's hip resurfacing, the blue line, the dotted line, and the solid line are the resurfacings. And this is heel strike, and this is toe off. And you see they just overlay each other. Whereas the hip replacements are very good compared to knee replacements. They're very good indeed. But they're not quite the same here, and they're not quite the same here. But the main thing is they're not going so fast. And their stride length, you see the stride length wasn't quite as fast. Cadence was the same, gait width was the same. Um, so this is actually all the data, and this is healthy, normal, age and sex match controls. Mm -hmm. This is the resurfacings, the same as the controls. They're not better, they're just the same as normal people. The replacements are slower. Mm -hmm. And what was that? And this is, that's now scaled for leg length. Mm -hmm. They're slower. And what was it? It was the stride length. The stride lengths are shorter. Again, scaled for leg length. Mm -hmm. But that's not randomized. So people said, that's just your, your um, you can't say this is not true. Um, so then um, Adil Akhil um, found a group of people who had one hip replacement and one hip resurfacing, one of each. So they were their own controls. Mm -hmm. And that there, there, and we got this, we did get this published. No one would publish other sorts of work. But going uphill, this is people with one, one of each, happy with both of them, discharged from follow-up. Mm -hmm. And the resurfaced one, this is the control group. The resurfaced one is closer to the normal than the replaced one. And they're the, of their own control. And even better than this, a very good um, Dutch group, Hoog van Sassanti in Holland. Now in Holland, hip resurfacing has been banned. You're not allowed to have hip resurfacing in Holland. But um, I think eight or nine years ago now, he did a randomized study of resurfacing against replacement. And just like every other randomized study, he couldn't show a difference using proms. So I said, oh, please will you use gait analysis? And so at a minimum of five years post-op, he looked at their gait. And these are randomized. So now we've got no selection bias at all. Mm -hmm. 
And what he found um, in his group, in Nijmegen, was that the um, UCLA, th there was a difference um, in UCLA, but not much. The important thing is the gate. Hang on. Um, they're all the same, sorry. The, the Oxford scores, Oxford hit scores, this is back to front, um, but 14 is 48, you know, it's the other way around, but they're the same, right? They're the same, there's no difference. But when it looks at gait, this is a top walking speed, and this is a hit resurfacing, mm -hmm. and this is eight kilometers an hour, symmetric, okay, just symmetric. This is hit replacement at seven kilometers an hour, and this is the good leg and this is the bad leg. So for this is a very good example of how um, the good leg has to work harder if you've had a hip resurfacing, sorry, the sun's changed, if you've had a hip replacement. So, and this is what you find in hip replacements. They're very happy, but if you push them as hard as they can go, the good leg has to work harder. And they were more than 10% slower than the resurfacing. That's randomized data that was published last year. So in objective metrics, at the top end, not at normal walking speed, they're the same. Mm -hmm. So if all you want to do is play golf, there's no point in pushing to have a hip resurfacing because it won't, it's not going to make any difference to your life at all. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you like speed, and I don't know, I don't know what, what it's like, even people on bicycles, I notice, seem to like speed, or some of them do. People uh, in London now, you cannot, you can bicycle beyond the speed limit. Um, um, but all those cars driving around, they can't go more than 20. It's a funny thing, isn't it? But, but for, for running, I think you'll still say running as fast as you can around London. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, it is, a, 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 that, this seems to be quite firm data, at least mm -hmm. uh, to me anyway, objective measures that at least allow us to say, well, now let's look at approaches to the hip. Now let's look at rehab regimes because these are things that might change and we've got a measure that can show it. Whereas if you stick with the Oxford score or EQ5D, you're never going to show it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah. And I think that it definitely is an exciting world because we, we have both um, uh, activity-based, personalized activity-based scores and objective measures that sit on top of them yeah. that I think reflect very much the same thing in hip pathology. Yeah. It wouldn't be the same for shoulders, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, so it seems there's there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of room room for improvement, even even within hip replacement. You know, which which many would say is the most successful procedure. So, well, I mean, uh, um, I, it is a safe and effective procedure compared to lots of things, definitely, and um, compared to how it used to be, it's still getting better and better. So, so it's it's great, but. You know, I'm a professor in a university where if you don't perform, you get fired. Mm -hmm. And so I have to do science. <laughs> and science means measuring things. Yeah. And measuring things mean having metrics that are capable of measuring things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you use those sorts of measures, which you have to do to publish science, yeah. then there's a big difference between these two procedures, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, if if we zoom back then, uh, or zoom out then a little bit, and look and look back rather, um, and you mentioned at the start that there has been a lot of improvement in surgery for hip arthritis over the years, yeah. a lot of measurable in, in, improvement. But what, what would you say has been the the main drivers behind that? What has been the most successful innovation or the biggest change generally to orthopedic practice that you've seen in in your career so far? Well, I think first of all, understanding we we. There's been a lot of um, really good work on on understanding why people wear out and how they wear out, the pattern of wearing out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually very reassuring in that really for most people today, we can say why this happened. Um, and that is almost always a combination, as almost everything in life is, of genes and environment and and activity levels yeah. and if if you're someone in your 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s who has worn out their hip then i hope you had a great time because i hope there are a whole lot of miles on the clock of this vehicle in order to wear it out yeah. 
Um, but some of them either, well, not either, they will have, that person will have loaded the seal of the joint, the labor of the joint beyond what it could cope with. Mm -hmm. um, and that seal will have failed mm -hmm. and the, the joint, the, the lubricant cycle will have failed. And once that lubricant cycle fails, the joint rubs away very quickly. And you just rub away until you're rubbing bone on bone, which causes pain and stiffness. And that, I think we know very clearly that, that for the vast majority of people, the um, natural history is not weird. It's very explicable. And I think one of, the, so one of the exciting things about today is being able to understand why someone got there. And then in, the, in the surgery, ideally be able to correct that problem yeah. um, the, the commonest thing of course being the femoral head and the socket were not spherical they were sort of rugby ball shaped and if they were rugby ball shaped the, the seal was going to fail it definitely was going to fail and if you replace that joint with a two spherical surfaces it's so much better in terms of tribology and lubrication they're very benign joints they work very very well so for all of those common, commonly men with rugby ball shaped hips, mm -hmm. just the replacement of the shape of their hips transforms their lives completely. Mm -hmm. Whereas I suppose the other group of people, um, the people with shallower sockets, mm -hmm. um, the hip dysplasia um, group who are more commonly female, um, there you have to, it's not so much lack of sphericity as lack of coverage. And you've got to alter the orientation of the hip to allow them to um, their hip to function normally again, and they're the big the big groups, aren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 so and so within that, so we've lo looking forward. Then, what, what do you think will be the the key advances in in surgery for hip arthritis in in the coming years, and perhaps even even lo looking a little bit further into the future? I think that the for in, in, in the middle of 2020, as much as any time in our lives, um, having operations that are, have got a lifetime guarantee, so you never need to go back into hospital ever again, I think that's, that would be a very nice thing to know. And so knowing that the device that's being put in has a durability that is well beyond your possible lifespan, that is a very good thing. And we have that now. So really i don't think there's any need for anyone i don't think there's any need for someone to be told you will wear this out if you do too much whereas when i started in orthopedics we were still absolutely using sir john charney's rules which were hip replacements don't last very long do not have this operation until you can't bear it any longer and then do not wear it out because if you wear it out bad things will happen whereas rather wonderfully now with modern bearings we can say almost the opposite. We can say, we know that if we leave you unfit, getting less fit, not only will your general health suffer, but your mental health will suffer. And that by restoring your activity level, we are doing a good thing for your health, your general health, your mental health, and the bearing surfaces we have available today are not things that can wear out in any normal human lifetime, as long as, the devices were made properly and the regulations around manufacture are very, very good these days. And the surgeon did the operation right, which is also much where we came in, which is getting the surgeon to do the operation right. So I would say the technology is wonderful now. We've just got to do it right. And the assistive technologies are a very, very interesting field, both in training people up to be expert surgeons and in ensuring that every operation is done exactly as you planned it. And that, those are the things that I think are coming along right now. Um, whereas 20 years ago, bizarrely, we could do the operation. We were doing operations with robotic assistance 20 years ago. But honestly, we didn't know where to, what to do. I think in the last 20 years, I now feel pretty confident in saying, I know that this is where your hip is now and we should change it to this. And these are the reasons why I'm saying we should change it mm -hmm. and that we can achieve those things. Whereas bizarrely, the first generation of robots in joint replacement were doing the operations 
exactly wrong every time because we didn't really know at the time we, we were doing our best but we didn't really know what the rules were in the fine print that we do now yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. and and you so you, you touched on there some assistive technologies yeah uh, would you want to elaborate a little bit on, on what so in, in, so assistive technologies um the simplest assistive technology of course is a ruler <laughs> um measuring how and david beverland in um, northern ireland has, does a wonderful talk about using a ruler um, throughout the operation just measuring the size and the offset and everything and frankly if every surgeon used a ruler for every step that's a pretty effective assistive technology but beyond the, the ruler um, using an x-ray machine in switzerland um, surgeons don't have to have a radiographer in the room they can just use the fluoroscope and just quickly flash to show things are right and so it's very common in switzerland almost i think it might even be normal to have a an x-ray guidance in the x-ray in the operating room without any extra person there just the machine in the uk um in um i think in cardiology you don't need a radiologist in the room um but in orthopedics you do so we there's a sort of one of those interesting closed shops that you can't break down that we're not allowed we have to wait for a radiographer and that for most people running a busy arthroplasty list that waiting for a radiographer means it's just you can't do it and so assistive technology is beyond x-ray and they're all all three systems broadly are allowing the surgeon to achieve their plan their operative plan okay okay interesting now do you do what do you have uh, next for us in the in the slides so if you'd like to i'll just talk a little bit about 3d printing because it's something that we've been doing a bit of yeah, yeah. Um, sorry here we go um so here so 3d printing is another assistive technology this is susanna clark who runs our 3d printing group this is To, um, a so so that that allows the plan and so here's somebody with a bent femur mm -hmm. um, move us over there um, here's somebody with an arthritic hip with a bent femur and by planning we can print out the instruments that allow us to correct the deformity and resurface the hip at the same time which um, I wouldn't have dared do before the days of 3D printing. And it can let you do all sorts of complicated um, knee surgery too. So that's really cool. And that 3D printing also gets into uh, efficiencies because if all the instruments are single use and printed for purpose, you can be really efficient in the operating theater. So that's a really exciting technology that is upskilling surgeons. Um, and the other one is, is virtual reality training. So there's a totally different technology using a headset and um, Kartik Nagashetti has published some really great work showing he can take surgeons who have never seen a direct anterior hip replacement, for instance, which is a, that's an interesting um, uh, technology. It's a technology. Mm -hmm. um, been around for more than 50 years. Um, and he can, he can, using VR training, take people and get them, if, if they're conventionally trained, they're down here. And if they're using formal um, assessments, surgical skill assessments, without ever having seen the operation in the flesh, that you take them to, to a cadaver lab, having done VR training, and they're experts compared to the people who've only done conventional training. So VR, and this is actually Derek Mamin, the father of hip resurfacing. This is him doing VR training um, in the lab. Um, um, he hates technology. He hates it. <laughs> um but um, so vr training that is pretty cool um so those are two those are two technologies that i think really have um great promise for delivering uh, um, a set of surgeons who can adopt new techniques mm -hmm. rapidly yeah. and then ensure that each time they do them they do it right yeah. and that's without those two um 
reassurances if you or I were delivering healthcare in a large bit of the United Kingdom, we wouldn't want anything, anything new adopted without that sort of safety net, I don't think. Yeah, fascinating. So we, we've covered quite a lot of ground here and, and stopped at yeah. some interesting points in this, in the, in this realm. Is, it, is there anything in particular you'd, you'd want to sort of highlight to, 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 to summarize this or? No, I think that's, um, that, I mean, that, that's, I think I'm trying not to be controversial. I'm trying, try and just say, you know, it's an exciting world and the future, there's, there's lots in store there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, what is your, what would be your, what is your vision for, for the future of, uh, of hip surgery? So my vision is that um, nobody, so I'm, um, I'm the most conservative person you'll meet in terms of not trying to cut bits out of people. Mm -hmm. And so I want everybody to maximize their potential in the short, medium and long term. And so for me, I, but the dream I think is, and it's not so far away, is that for all those people who can, who have still got good quality femoral heads and necks, but they only have a resurfacing rather than a replacement, and it's done through a, a small incision, they go home the same day, they don't ever have to go into a hospital, they have this done in an ambulatory surgery center, they go out on crutches um, and get on with their lives. And that intervention for most people will be the last intervention they need in their lifetime. Um, and this picture in the middle of the screen here is, is a, I'm terribly biased, but we're in the middle of a clinical trial of that, which is very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we'll, we'll watch this space. We'll be, uh, yep. we, we may well uh, revisit that in a, in, in a separate video. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Professor Cobb. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I'm sure this video will, will spark a lot of other questions and ideas. And for anyone out there, please do send in uh, any questions or suggestions for other topics to get to and let us know what you thought of it. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into it in a separate video. And of course, Stay safe out there and uh, we'll see you next time. So thanks very much, everyone.